Um, they say never start a presentation with an apology. I'll start with a few. Um, the first one is there's about 175 slides here. Yeah. Um, some of them are going to go past very, very fast indeed. The BBC always warns you that if you suffer from epilepsy, look away, there's going to be flash photography, there's going to be some, some flash sliding going on here. Um, the second is that I do have a certain amount of presenters' Tourette's. Um, I'll try and behave myself, particularly if I'm being recorded. Um, but if I slip into vernacular as I go along, I'm really sorry. Um, I, I will try and behave. Um, Sergio asked me to reflect upon how different things are as a result of what we, the British military, Western militaries, have been doing in the last 10 years or so, and how different that's going to make how we do stuff in the future. That's the sort of background to um, what I'm about to bombard you with. I was asked to do something very similar on the higher command and staff course in the Joint Services Staff College. And what they tend to do when they ask you to do something is not just ask you to do something, but write you a three-page letter telling you exactly what it is that you're going to say. And uh, this thing works. There's the first paragraph of the remit they gave me. Good, able military stuff. <laughs> Which, as I say, ran on for, for, for three pages. When Sergio said, right, I'd like you to come along, and, and I said, okay, a little bit of clarity on what you'd like me to talk about would be a good idea. This is his remit. <laughs> um, which is frankly much better. <laughs> and allows me to think about what it is that I'm going to say. So, what am I going to do? Um, I'll start off by talking a little bit, just a few opening thoughts about history, about nature and character, the difference between the two things. Because to me, that's the fundamental. That'll get me going. I'll then talk about the enduring nature of what it is that we soldiers do in a land environment, not just British soldiers, soldiers in general. And then the context that British soldiers do their soldiering in, the enduring context, the thing that's not going to change. Having done that, having said what's not going to change, I'll then talk a little bit about what is going to change, what I think is going to change, bearing in mind there's no such thing as the foreseeable future. I'll try and do some foreseeing and talk around that a bit, and then go into some of the current army thinking that you might find quite interesting, what's going to happen to the army in this period of change to the British Army. Okay. Start with um, Clausewitz. All of us doctrinal um, folk like a bit of Clausewitz. In fact, of course, it was Mrs. Clausewitz, because Clausewitz didn't actually write the book. His wife did, after Clausewitz had died. So pissed off was she of living with the man who for years and years had done absolutely nothing except write notes and not talk to her. But after he died, she sat down and said, well, we're going to make something of this. It's be a nightmare living with a bastard. We must be together and produce a book. So Mrs. Clausewitz said um, that there is an essential difference between the nature and the character of things. The nature of things is what makes them a thing. War is a war because it's like this. But the character of it will be different in every single war that you come across. And I think that people confuse these two things a great deal. And to me, this is an absolute fundamental. You'll see what I mean as I go through. Um, a lot of what Marx says looks jolly good on the surface, but when you actually get to try and apply it, it's not quite so bright. One of the things that is most often quoted from Marx and applied to all sorts of different people, or attributed to all sorts of different people, is that history repeats itself. And the logical conclusion from that is the study of history will inform you. Bismarck said something along the lines of it's much less painful to learn from other people's mistakes than to make mistakes yourself. Uh, there are all sorts of people, Santayana, um, uh, Hegel, et al., talking about learning from history so that you don't have to make the mistakes yourself. So if history repeats itself, all we have to do is look at history and understand that what happens next is going to be very similar to what happened before. There's a good basic logic then, a practical reason for learning history. But as I say, like a lot of what Marx said, um, I'm not sure I agree. I much prefer Mark Twain. 
who said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure as hell does rhyme. <laughs> and that, to me, if this thing will actually keep working, uh, that, to me, is one of the most profound remarks about the use of history that I have ever come across. Because what he's saying is it's not going to be the same. It's like expecting a line of poetry to finish with the same word every time. It's not going to be the same word. It's going to be similar, but it's going to be different. So in saying that, what he's encouraging you to do is look for the similarities, not the sameness. So expect it to be similar but different. And we in the military fall into the trap of expecting it to be the same. The American military is sick to death with the British military telling them that we got it right in Malaya. Malaya is a jolly good model. You can learn the principles of counterinsurgency from Malaya and you can take it off and you can tire lever it onto anywhere else that you like, and it will be fine. You can take Malaya and apply it to Iraq, and there's a set of principles there that will work, because it's going to be the same. But as we found out, it's not the same. There are differences. And by concentrating on the similarities, and not thinking through the fact that there are differences to get your mind around as well, you miss a trick. So, um, what I'm saying is, how can you spot the difference until you've got a basis to spot the difference from? Let's play the game. Let's spot the difference with audience participation. Hands up when you can spot the difference. Go on, then. One that has animals, but yet one doesn't. Well, there's only one picture, isn't there? Yes. <laughs> and that's the problem. Because I live in a world where people have been on operations for 10 years, and I am constantly bombarded by hoary veterans saying, well, it's all fucking different now, isn't it, boss? Different from what? Different from what it was before. How do you know? You didn't do the before. You spent years, 10 years doing the now, and boy are you right, and you've got 10 years of now under your fingernails. But that doesn't mean that it's different. How would you know it's different? You didn't do the different before. So if this is the now, people are making an assumption that they know what that is. They're making an assumption that this is different. You've got to have another picture to be able to spot the difference. So let's play spot the difference. Let's concentrate on the cow here. What's the difference? What do you notice? Okay. It's got a spot. Well done. We spotted that. What else do you notice? No, constantly. Don't get clever. Concentrate on the cow. The door locked. No, just the cow. Stay with the cow. Stick with me, troops. Stay with the cow. What else do you notice about the cow? Shall I tell you what I notice? It's still a fucking cow. <laughs> and the trouble is that people look at them and they spend their whole time talking spots because they've spotted that there's a different spot. And they forget that what they're dealing with is a cow. <laughs> they talk about the character of war and they forget that what they're in is a war. They get so obsessed with the character of what they're dealing with that they throw the whole cow away and just talk spots and think they've discovered something new. I'll give you an example. I was at a conference about three years ago of all the senior people in the infantry. And the first three speakers talked about a formation for infantry to patrol in called the Afghan snake, which is basically 14 blokes walking one behind the other with two blokes out front with mine sweeping equipment. This makes absolutely no tactical sense anywhere in the world except Afghanistan right now. But as a result of that conversation, people talking about casualties, uh, need for R&R, &R, people get home and have a rest, etc., 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 they were saying the infantry section, which for the last couple of hundred years has been eight men, just does not work for the infantry, for the modern infantry. We need to change that. We need to make the basic building block of infantry units 14 men. Because we've learned that to make an Afghan state work, you need 12 men and you need two replacements. And the room sat there nodding. 
Yeah, makes sense to me. Let's rearrange the whole infantry. Because all of the body at the back, because well, of course all the senior people were sitting at the front, the remaining eight or ten tiers were all poorly veterans of ten years' experience of this, and nobody at the front was going to gainsay them, and they were all murmuring and saying, yeah, absolutely, we do need to reshape ourselves. But this is talking spots, not cows. When Marius reformed the Roman army, he spotted that by and large, eight men worked together under the control of one bloke with one bloke to help him. When the snot and blood started flying, by and large, human interaction worked in such a way that eight men was a, the sort of size of group that worked. And for a couple of thousand years, most armies in the world had used eight men as the basic human interaction building block for doing the grubby business of infantry work. But because we'd been doing Afghan states for a few years, the whole British army was about to rearrange itself because it was concentrating on the spots. But we didn't. Because somebody stood up and said, wait a minute, cows and spots. <laughs> Modesty prevents me from saying who it was who stood up. Okay, so, a little bit of enduring nature then. What do I think the enduring nature of being a soldier is all about? What's it like? First of all, I think it's important to put it in a joint context. Joint being the military parlance for Army, Navy and Air Force. There's Navy, there's Air Force, there's Army. This is not a bad little analogy. In my days as a, as a rower and as a rugby player, the sort of fizz you were required to do for these two things was pretty similar. There's an awful lot of similarity stuff that goes on here. But when you actually go out to do the competitive business, there's a huge difference between the two. These folk get into, literally, a boat. They have one person in charge, often small and irritating, <laughs> who, when they pull the tillers, the whole lot go in one particular direction. And I remember from my rowing days that we were told that if you don't all stroke together, you catch crabs, which I'm told in the Navy means something entirely different. <laughs> So you have to get a team operating together as a team with one person dictating exactly what they do and where they go. And if you don't, if you get one person who is stroking out of sync, then the whole thing very quickly falls apart. In the army, things are really very different. You do a whole load of stuff on the training paddock. You do a whole load of skills and drills. But actually, when the thing starts, you've got 15 people independently charging around the place all thinking, trying to read the game. There are certain set things that you need to do together, but actually all of those individuals are doing a whole bunch of individual things. All of those eight men that that one person is trying to look after, right up to divisions, corps, and army groups, all of those individuals are thinking different things. Hunkered down, all sorts of shit going on around them, and thinking... What am I going to do now? That's an entirely different thing from this game here. There's a closeness, there's a crewness, there's a similarity in many ways, but there's a huge difference too. And then, down here in the Royal Air Force, there's a different game going on entirely. There's one bloke in the cab who takes all the credit. There's one Lewis Hamilton. But all around him, there's a bunch of people... And as you know, if you like Formula One, having the machine working properly is just as important as, as the ability of the pilot, but it's the pilot who takes the credit. That's not a, a bad analogy for how we do our things differently. And it's quite important for soldiers, sailors, and <coughs> airmen to understand each other, and we're really very bad at it. We have a different ethos, different ethoi, I'm told the correct Greek plural is, I'm in a place of learning, so I should use the correct plural. But we're not good at understanding each other. The Royal Air Force has a very different existence from the soldiers. We make a great play of the fact that we, army officers, put our soldiers first. Our ethos is all about Tommy Atkins. We make it almost religious. I will eat after my soldiers have eaten. I will not sleep until my soldiers are sleeping. I will not rest until my soldiers are resting. 
because you think about it, it makes absolutely no sense at all because I'm supposed to be doing the thinking. And if I'm in bits, the thinking is not being done. But actually, like most ethoi, there's a practical, pragmatic reason on the pinning it right from the start. And that is that my tool is Tommy Atkins. The thing that I am applying to the problem is the soldier. If he's not rested and fed and his morale's not high, etc., 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 he's not going to do the business. And in the Air Force, actually the guy in harm's way, the tool, the thing that is making the equipment work to your advantage, is that pilot. So it's right that it should, the ethos should be inverted. The private soldier, if you like, should be making sure that the pilot is rested. We in the army will still take this out of the bastards, of course we will, that's part of our ethos. But we need to understand it. And actually, if I've got a leg hanging off behind some canal bund in Helmand province, with the snot and blood flying around, and a guy coming in to land in a brown out, dust everywhere, under fire, I hope the bastard did sleep in their conditioned room last night and have a beer if he wanted one, one beer, if he wanted one. And access to a swimming pool. Because that means that he's sharp behind the controls of what he does. He needs to be doing something different. That's not a bad building block analogy. The bottom line, although we give each other a hard, a, a hard time, is we're all in harm's way in different ways. Our working conditions are stressful and difficult. In the army, they tend to be a bit grubbier. And that's not just in the current sort of stuff we're doing. It's in all of the stuff that we do. Life is pretty unpleasant, uncomfortable, smelly and dirty. Living conditions in the Navy are pretty unpleasant. Uh, when you're in operations in the Air Force, not quite so unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> but when we come off our smelly, dirty day job, the conditions we live in are equally unpleasant, even if you're a prince of the royal blood. <laughs> and logistics, because, rugby analogy, individuals are charging around the place, logistics go right down to the individual. Wartime logistics for the Air Force and the Navy are about getting big lumps of demanding stuff to big places. In the Army, they're about getting stuff down to individual people and pairs of people. And when people get hurt, getting individuals and individual pairs out of harm's way. That makes the complexity of the logistic puzzle much, much bigger. And the, I hope I'm going to nuclear physics, physicists here, because this is a very bad um, analogy in astrophysics terms. But imagine a comet moving through the sky where the light is fed by the tail. If that's an army formation moving, the minute you cut the tail, the light stops moving and goes out. That means that moving huge lumps of army around the countryside is an extremely complicated thing to do. Huge strings of vehicles moving over a number of routes all at the same time. The minute you move somebody across the back of that, because there's trouble happening up there, so we want to move these people to there, this stops. <laughs> Combine that with logistics, and keeping armies moving is a difficult thing. My Navy colleague tells me that nature, Mother Nature, interferes with everything that they do. They can cope with it because they're sailors. <laughs> The Air Force tell me that a light drizzle interferes with what they do. They cope with it by not flying. <laughs> but for us, nature interferes with what we do too. Of course it does. Anyone trying to survive on land on the east coast of America right now knows exactly what we're talking about. The difference in the land environment is that it's not just temporally inconvenient. It's often campaign decisive. And of course, and there's a clue in the land environment, land plays a part in everything that we do. Soldiers are obsessed with the shape of the land. They have to be. And when you talk to other military planners, not soldiers, they will look at things like this, for example, and see a little blue line on the map and wonder why it's causing you such an issue. That's quite tricky to get your tanks across. Soldiers are obsessed with land, and land plus man is seriously, seriously difficult stuff. And because it's so difficult, soldiers tend to ignore it and train in the countryside. And because training in amongst where you live would not be particular pop particularly popular, we definitely train in the countryside. 
And we call it realistic training, but it's probably virtual reality, even when we're using live rounds. Because this is where we're going to be doing our stuff. But the bottom line is, a piece of kit's a person. And boy, is it up close and personal. At the moment, there are 19-year-old boys from my regiment who are stepping out tonight on patrol. They will be in contact. Some of them will be being shot at, I hope. Oh, we're getting hurt. But they will be hurting people in what they do. That's a really tricky thing to ask a 19-year-old kid to do. Not only that, but because of the way we do war, when the whistle goes, you are expected to go and help the people who have just been shooting at you and at whom you have been shooting. A platoon commander might just have been wounded and you've just been kneeling in his chest trying to sort him out. You love your platoon commander. You get him on the back of a helicopter. You're angry. End of contact. There's a wounded Talon lying there who's quite possibly the man who just shot your boss. You're asking a 19-year-old kid to go and give him first aid too. Switching aggression, killing aggression on and off. Soldiers are extremely superstitious people. The boys on the last tour from my regiment worked out that there was a one in six chance of being killed or wounded every time he went out on patrol. So like idiots, they started shaking dice. I've seen 19-year-old kids being sick in the loading bay because they've shaken a one. So what we're asking people to do is a really unique thing. They know what that strange, rusty, wet iron smell of somebody else's blood smells like because they felt the last warm breath of somebody that they've been dealing with. That's a huge ask. And that's a pretty unique thing. I dwell on it for a reason. It's also among people. And this is a new military buzz phrase. General Sir Rupert Smith, after he retired about six years ago, wrote a book, I'll return to it later, talked about war among people as a new idea. But it always has been. There's more of that to come. I think the feel of what we do is pretty timeless. These are my boys at Drum Creek, and boy did it feel like that. <coughs> Stuff I've done in trenches felt like that. And that's a soldier from, soldiers from my regiment, soldiers from my regiment, soldiers from my regiment. There's a timelessness about what we do. Walking a long way, carrying an absurdly heavy load because some idiot thinks it's a good idea, is something I've unfortunately spent an unnecessarily large amount of my time doing. It's about these boys. And all of that is nature. None of that's got anything to do with what we're doing at the moment. It's got everything to do with what it's always like. That's why I've laboured the point. That is what it's like. There's some enduring context, too, if you're a Brit doing this stuff. And the first thing is, as my naval counterparts always point out to me, is that we're a trading island nation. If I don't understand what we are, they point out that there is a clue. <laughs> and they trot out a whole bunch of statistics about how 87% of our bought energy, stuff we've paid for, is at any one time afloat, etc., etc., etc. Of course, they're absolutely right. And we have to understand that. We soldiers have to understand that that's the enduring context of what we do. Which means that we're either going to be fighting at home, very occasionally and existentially, and let's hope that we never have to, or we're going to be fighting away from home, which you guys have better hope is the normal default setting. But that if we're going to get anywhere in any way, we need a navy to get us there. And what we don't need to do is what we been spending the last few years doing, which is arguing in a scarce resource environment against the Navy and against the Air Force for a bunch of resources, so that the Navy wants 
ruling the waves is down to about that sort of size. It's a bit bigger than that, but not much. Which is pretty irresponsible and actually a real problem for the nation and for the arm. And of course, we also have to remember that although we're an island, we're a continental power because we're a member of a treaty organisation that makes us part of a continental power that gives us, for example, an inconvenient treaty with Poland that we've had once before that pulled us into something against our policy direction. But we also need to think hard about air power because air power is absolutely part of what soldiers do. And a casual study of the demise of the 7th Army, probably the most proficient fighting force the world's ever seen, at the Falaise Gap in the Normandy campaign at the end of the Second World War, will show you how total air supremacy can totally remove a land component. But the bottom line is, air, both the ability to move around by it, and to deliver munitions from it, and to see and hear and watch from it, is our asymmetric edge. We talk about asymmetry all the time, as if only opponents can be asymmetric. And so soldiers not making the most of this are foolish soldiers. All of that is enduring stuff, too, when we go about our business. OK, so much for what won't change. So what will change? Well, my organization uh, does, on behalf of not just defense, but the government, a global strategic trends project which looks out into the future, it looks across absolutely everything, demographics, climate, economy, all sorts of things, and tries to guess what the future is going to look like. Of course we'll be wrong, but the trick is to be as least wrong as possible. And from that, we try and have a look at what we think the future character of conflict is going to be like. I'm not going to talk much about that. If you're interested, both of these are available online. That in particular is available online. Just go to the DCDC website, just put in DCDC, FCOC, we like our abbreviations, and uh, Google straight to it. So, what does it tell us? Well, the first thing is that actually, slim little booklet, importantly, this is the first time that the whole MOD and actually Whitehall has agreed on one view of what it thinks we need to be interested in. About time. Uh, has, slides are about to speed up, has a whole bunch of assumptions, you don't need to worry about them. It has a whole bunch of things about where we think the world might be going, don't need to worry about it. And it uses a nice, alliterated way of describing what we think the world would be like, which I thought was horribly trite to begin with, but actually it's not a bad way of remembering stuff. It had some implications, don't need to worry about those. I'm sure you'll get, you're going to keep all the slides so you can, you can come back to them. But what it absolutely said is this is not about a binary choice between the Colin Gray world of industrial wars always been like that, just wait, we'll be back to it shortly, and the Rupert Smith, it's all war among people, the end of industrial war. It's not about binary choices at all, it's about all of the above. And it's absolutely not saying that Iraq or Afghanistan is a pointer for the way ahead, it's always going to be like that from now on. But it produced a bunch of unanswered questions, and this is what's actually quite interesting, I think. It was what it didn't answer, but what it asked, that was more useful to me than the statement of what you could argue was sublimely obvious. And underlying all of that was, if, if this is going to be different, then we can't do things the same way. There's an old saying that the only thing harder than getting a new idea into the military mind is getting an old one out. Boy, is that true. But what it led to was the Vice Chief of Defence Staff saying, well, in that case, we need to think this through properly. We need to experiment with this. And that experiment run from four star down to one star, including a minister or two, spent two lots of two days looking at a whole load of problem sets based on that future character of conflict scenario and saying, OK, so what do we think? And here are some of the ideas that came out of it. Here's the first one. Do you remember this? A force for good? Robin Cook and Tony Blair. Force for good. There are still people in the Ministry of Defence who walk around with the lanyard ribbon with their badge on with force for good written on it. What the fuck does that mean? Who would be a force for bad? 
<laughs> Not even the Waffen SS had lanyards with force for bad. And yet that was the underpinning strategic strap line against which defence strategic planners were supposed to be working. You're to go out in the world and deliver philanthropic violence. Work that one out. Institutionally not thinking through strategy. And not just in the Ministry of Defence, but across the whole of the whole of Whitehall. And actually, if you are going to be a force of good, that's fine. That's fine. But let's work out who's good. They're good, or they're good. Actually, I don't mind which, providing somebody articulates to me the why. And this street from that phallic symbol down to that phallic symbol is extremely bad at getting its act together and working out what the strategic intent behind stuff is. That matters to me, not just because I passionately believe that actually there should be an underpinning vision and rationale and strategy and all those good things, but actually in a very human way. You saw his photograph earlier on. Mike Lockett, Sergeant Mike Lockett, Military Cross. Three tours in Afghanistan. I stood with his mum, with his wife, and because he was a complicated man, his girlfriend, <laughs> and his three impossibly blonde, blue-eyed little children holding their hands as we buried him. That's Rupert Bowers, Vicky. He met Vicky just before he went on his first tour of Afghanistan, where he was decorated, you see it on his chest, for gallantry on his first ever patrol. He married her just before his second tour of Afghanistan, and within a couple of weeks was wounded in action. She got the knock on the door. He was fine. He couldn't wait to go back out. He went back out, completed the tour. He came back from his third tour on the day, the very day, that Vicky and the then eight-week-old Hugo was expecting him back. Sadly, he came back dead. I buried him and her, held her hand too. I've done that 20 times now. And actually, I was about to say I don't mind doing that. I do mind doing it. Why do I make a point of it, though? Because we understand what we're signing up for. That's part of our deal. That is an absolutely nature of being a soldier thing. But I would rather we were doing it by design and for advantage. And an examination of what FCOP was saying, the future character of conflict was saying, was, boy, we'd better think through much more deeply than just philanthropic violence sports for good, because boy does it matter. And I feel that with a deep, deep passion. Anyone read a book called The J-Curve Theory? You good? Don't. <laughs> it's really dull, but what it basically says, and it's a bit of a no-brainer, is the worse things get, here's things getting worse on the curve, the longer it's going to take and the more resource it's going to take to sort things out. It applies to anything in life. And if you can get them about here, where it says authoritarian on the graph, if you can jump in there, by and large, you can sort things out relatively quickly, and it doesn't take much effort. But there's a paradox here, because people that think force for good and something must be done and shout something must be done, and people have been shouting about him for some time and saying something must be done, and yet nothing's been done, is because there is a paradox of international law which says until things are right down here in a nadir of nastiness, you're not allowed to do anything. Westphalian law, international law, says you can't interfere with each other. So it's not until it gets awful that you commit, that you're allowed to commit. What that means is that if you live in a world that says something must be done, and boy do we, you better understand that when you send people off to do it, it's going to take a long time, and it's going to take a lot of resource to do it. We're very good, we think, at being resilient in the UK. Next one. 7-7, seven, seven, the day after, I guess 8-7, there were people standing at this bus stop looking at what's saying, it's a bloody bus. I'm resilient, me, blitz spirit, bandana, have the jabby, bus. We think we're really good. I wonder whether we are. I wonder how resilient you guys would be, actually, if you call an ambulance and one doesn't come. 
Or if you turn the tap on and water doesn't come out of it. Or God help you if you can't get a mobile signal permanently. <laughs> or EastEnders isn't on. Or Downton isn't on. We're really not resilient at all, but kid ourselves that we are. We're superficially resilient. And because of that, we as a nation need to understand that maybe, unattractive though it is as a nation, we might have to play away games if we don't want games to come home to us. We've also spent a long time in the military doing stuff beginning with R. Rapid reaction. What that means to me is wait and see what happens. That's not very dynamic. But more importantly, this is a hugely expensive way of doing defence. Being able to react rapidly to lots of different things means you need a whole bunch of people trained, ready, sitting, waiting, doing nothing else. That's enormously expensive. So, you get rid of the initiative, and it's the most expensive way you can possibly do stuff. And, and I'll return to this later, boy have we forgotten how to understand the world in a way that our Victorian and Edwardian grandfathers, great-grandfathers really, really did. Plug ourselves in and understand and become involved with. The Foreign Office and Defence have retreated from the world enormously. We as a nation are not good at this. So instead, perhaps we can do something called continuous engagement. A quick explanation of the graph. Here's the sort of amount of effort and people, time. Dotted line is something nasty and unexpected. <coughs> Yellow line, uh, sorry, white line, lots of folk out in the world, continuously engaged, understanding in the Edwardian manner. They can see something's going to get bad. They put a bit more effort in. Before it gets bad, quite a lot of effort. And when the bad thing would have happened, you can nip it and deal with it. But that's expensive. So what you do is you write a policy that says, let's imagine that bad things never happen and let's try and get away with this sort of level of commitment in the world. And we'll potter along like that. And when something does happen, we won't have seen it coming. And actually that takes that amount of people, effort and time to deal with. And when financial times are straightened as they currently are, the default setting of policy writers has to be to default to here and hope the dotted yellow lines never happen, but we know that they do. And, no surprise, and I love this slide because the PT man from the Navy is getting a, an award from McDonald's. <laughs> the bottom line is, it is in all that we do about people. Heard that before, haven't you? And in all of that, the conclusion of that great four days of study was that first point that I made about force for good and strategic understanding has really got to be where the Ministry of Defence puts its mind and effort. At the same time, my organisation produces lots of written work, lots of doctrine. There's a huge, great, thick thing that talks about the sort of thing that we're doing at the moment, and for the hard of reading, a little boiled down version. When you go online, I suggest you go to that one, not use this one. It fits in and amongst a whole bunch of <coughs> allied stuff. It was written along with other government departments. And it talks about stabilizing fragile or failed states. It talks about the before, the during, the after. It gives a bunch of principles, because military people like principles. It gives lots of nice pictures and diagrams that categorize things, because we like <coughs> categorizing. It talks about campaign authority. What does that mean? It talks about political primacy. Politicians have got to be in charge, but as Elliot Cohen said, there's got to be unequal dialogue. It talks about host nation sovereignty. Who's in charge? Well, by and large, probably the people to whom the country belongs ought to be in charge. And by the way, responsible too. It talks about followership, and boy are we Brits bad at that. I can come back to that in questions if you like. And it talks about influence. One of the most frustrating meetings I've ever been at was chaired by a brigadier who kept saying, who in the headquarters is responsible for influence? To me, that's like saying, who in the headquarters is responsible for victory? Well, everybody is. Everything you do influences. Military people use influence as if it were a word, often with a capital letter, to mean something that you do. You shoot someone, get influenced. And so is his family, by the way, too. This explains that. 
And it talks about doing stuff with other people, lots of good buzzwords. Because the security line is not the bottom line. It is the enabler. It is the thing that allows the other lines, all the other stuff that's got to be done, to happen. A secure environment allows governance to happen, and so on and so forth. And the only way you get persistent security effect, and I can return to that in questions too, if you like, is by having people on the ground, something that right now is not popular. And when I talk about this to RAF people, they say, well, wait a minute, I did persistent security effect for nine years over Iraq in a no-fly zone. Well, you did. And well done you. But actually, if you're, let's say, a Bosnian family, and 12 people have burst in and raped the mother of the family in front of the family and said, we'll be back tomorrow for your daughters unless you move out forever, you don't get persistent security effect from a fast jet flying over twice at tea time. You do if you've got 12 blokes in the house in uniform, a female soldier with the children and the wife, and a tank parked on the front lawn. But that takes a huge commitment. So if we're going to give security effect, we need to understand the size of the commitment we give when we talk about safe areas and other euphemisms like that. And for a soldier, it's very, very difficult to articulate the need for mass and lots of people without sounding like you're advocating lots of people and lots of money. Even doing things like, well, look, Governor, there's Londonderry with about 100 bad people in it and a brigade to look after it. Broadly speaking, went quite well. There's Basra with about 10,000 people in it and a brigade to look after it. Broadly speaking, didn't go so well. Bit of a no-brainer. Okay, so, I'll now get on to what I've been asked to talk about. How is it different? Is it different? First thing to say is, um, the classic image of the Army General, there's Bradford's Buller, is don't do thinking. Lions led by donkeys. So by definition, I was a lion, I'm now a donkey. I'm not sure when it was that my brain, heart and courage was taken out, but clearly it was. But actually, encouraging people not to do thinking is something that armies are really very good at. And when they do think they've had a really good idea, when they think they've had a doctrinal epiphany, everybody leaps in, writes it with capital letters, and gets very excited. They say, this is what we used to do, this is Germany, this is Eastern Front, this is Soviet stuff, conventional capital C, warfare, capital W, that's gone now. Thank goodness for that. Rupert Smith wrote a book, we've done a whole bunch of stuff, we've got a new idea. Asymmetric war, hybrid war, you'll have heard all the buzzwords. And hybrid warfare with capital letters, preferably, because then we don't have to think about it, because it's no longer an adjective, it's now a proper noun, is a whole brand new way of looking at stuff. That's what we do now. Actually, it's not a bad adjective, there's some of the definitions of it. But once you turn it into a label, and excuse thinking and make it a noun, it becomes meaningless. Where you put it in, just as an adjective, it has meaning. Where you're using it in the modern sense, it's got a capital letter at the beginning there because it's the beginning of the sentence, to describe adversaries, then actually it's not a bad adjective. It's got some nature to it, and it's got some character to it. Right now, the character of those things means that there is a difference to the hybridity. It's globalised, franchised, it's through proxies, it's moving at a speed that it never was before, so it's worth looking at. But we, and you in the academic world, have a habit of abbreviating, capitalising things and saying, got that, niche, pigeonhole, label, done, essay, finished, no longer need to think about it. That's certainly how the Israelis approach life. And in 2006, they got the wake-up call. And actually, a study of Bint Jabil, that village up there, and Centuripe, a very similar village in Sicily in 1943, is an interesting comparison of timelessness. But not only were they good at knocking tanks over, they used the same sort of kit to knock boats over too. Or ships, as my naval colleagues insist on calling them. And it gave the Israelis a big wake-up call and a big rethink. And by and large, militaries don't rethink until they get a real kick. 
And if we are in a world now where the sort of people that we're dealing with are fighting us by franchising ideas, why is it that we spend so much time thinking about hardware and not about franchising ideas? A whole new way of thinking about how we go about stuff. So, what is hybrid warfare? Or maybe, as I say, without the capitals, it's hybrid warfare. And is it new? Have we had a doctrinal epiphany? Is this old war and this new war? As those guys that have spent the last ten years fighting will tell us, it is like this now, that's how it used to be. A war of pitch battles. Or audience participation. Hundred Years' War. How many battles from the Hundred Years' War can you sing out? Historians? Any? Hundred Years' War. Agincourt. Cressy. Poitiers. My naval colleagues tell me Sius at the beginning of the Hundred Years' War. And there were two others, but the French won those, so we don't learn. <laughs> Hundred Years' War didn't go on as advertised, went on for 116 years, or 117, depending on when you think the treaty was signed. So what was going on for the remainder of the time if there were only three land and one sea battle? It wasn't the war of chivalry and pitched battles. It was the war of chevauchee. A chevauchee is a raid where you go out into the, into the world in a way that Serbian hit squads would recognise, rape, pillage, plunder and burn to try and provoke the opposition into doing something. That's what they were doing for the rest of the Hundred Years' War. Oops, that's not good. There we go. And actually, the Thirty Years' War, which did go on for the amount of time advertised, left Central Europe totally and utterly empty of people and animals. Because it was completely a war among people. That's the way war is and always has been. Or maybe it's not. Napoleonic Wars. I wouldn't ask you to sing out the battles of the Napoleonic Wars because we'll be here all night. Maybe. <laughs> but this seems to me, here's, the, here's the, the pinnacle of the battlefield war. It was absolutely about battlefields. Or was it? There's my regiment about to behave badly at Badajoz. What about the peninsula war, the Spanish Elsa? If you read any accounts of that, it has a horrible resonance with now. Baron de Marbeau, I recommend, if you're interested in that sort of thing, you read the memoirs of this boy. And if you can't be bothered to read those, the Arthur Conan Doyle piss-taking version of them of Brigadier Gerard is really worth reading because it's fun too. But it has a resonance. Here's a bit of it. I'll give you a moment to read it whilst I have a quick slur. Or maybe Conan Doyle didn't write that. Maybe I've stolen this from Brigadier Ed Butler's report at the end of the first big punch-up in Helmand. Have a read of that. I leave it to you to decide which of those two is genuine. It could be either, couldn't it? So maybe World War II was the great war of manoeuvre and not a war among people at all. Certainly, according to Rupert Smith, it was the pinnacle of industrial war. Well, come on, tell all these people that it wasn't a war among people. Of course it was. So where have we got this notion from? It's from the Cold War, where my memory, going back 30-something years when I first joined the army, is... Civilians were only mentioned in paragraph 14D of coordinating instructions under bulldoze the bastards off the road so your comet can keep moving. We imagined that there wouldn't be civilians there because they were inconvenient. We'd call something capital C, capital W, conventional war. We'd made a convention of it because it suited us, but it was a virtual reality. And at the same time, because money was short, as it always is, we kidded ourselves that if you train for the heavy end conventional war, everything else is easy, and argued for resource accordingly. And we had a hubris about coin that said, we've done all that stuff. 
of Victorian and Edwardian grandparents and great-grandparents, I've used the phrase three times now, did all this stuff so it's in our blood. We don't need to train for it, because we know how to do it. It's not conventional. So there was a Cold War warfare mentality that says this is the norm, that made it the norm because it was convenient so to be, but actually was a fantasy. We labelled it. Broke some capital letters and excused ourselves thinking. So when we woke up and smelled the coffee, we said, we've discovered something new. No, you haven't. You've just spotted the fucking cow. <laughs> so, what have we done about that? Well, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can find on the website. I recommend to you the Army Doctrine Primer. It's a short read, and it tells you all about Army Doctrine. If you're interested, that's an afternoon's read. But the future land operating concept very much frames what it is that I've been asked to talk about. It's in a couple of parts, one that gives context and relevant factors, what I've been talking about, and one that looks forward to the future roles of the army. But it warns us that policy and crystal ball gazing are always interfered with by events, dear boy, events. It draws on global strategic trends, future character conflict, all that sort of work rather than repeating it. And it takes those factors, and because I was the editor of it, it looks at them in nature and character and divides the two up and says, what are the two things you need to think about? It points out, count. It makes a series of introductions. You don't need to worry about those, because in big handfuls, it says, we're going to be required to do more with less, but we know that physics tells us that you can't. So we're going to have to do stuff differently. We are going to have to buy kit in a way that we currently don't. By and large, it takes us 10 to 15 years to buy big bits of kit. We need to buy them in 10 to 15 days. And it's people who give you real agility. When you're playing chess against somebody, you don't sit there staring at the chessboard saying, I wonder what that bishop's going to do next, unless you're playing against a bishop. <laughs> you sit there thinking, I wonder what that person is going to do. Because it's the person, the thinking person, that makes the difference. And to prove it, we've written doctrine about the physical component, which is mostly people, the conceptual component, which is in people's heads, and the moral component, which is in people's heads and hearts. And we ignore the right-hand side of that at our peril. And then in part two, it gives a resulting conceptual approach, which talks about understanding in order to be able to influence stuff. It gives you a model, just concentrate on the pink bit, that says if you really do understand stuff, and you understand what power is, then you can influence stuff in all that you do the way you want it to. It talks about injecting yourself into the world to generate a real level of understanding that is not about just data streams. You talk to the intelligence world and they'll talk about, get me more data and I'll understand. Well, I don't know much about nuclear physics, as you might have gathered, atomic physics or any physics at all. And if somebody sits here with a whiteboard and writes, OK, Sharpie, old boy, E equals MC squared, you understand that, don't you? The answer is, no, I don't. And if you say, well, come on, and write another 57 equations on the board of more and more complexity, I don't understand more and more. But actually, a lot of the intelligence world tells you that if you do that, you get better understanding. Really understanding somebody is about proximity, endurance, and time. It talks about the nature of power, which is just quite simply about getting people to do stuff that they might not want to do but suits you. It talks about influence. I've already talked about that. And says you need hard stuff, as well as thinking about minds, as well as embracing all this sort of stuff that currently I'm not allowed to embrace, as well as doing all that sort of stuff. And it talks about exploitation. It talks about taking things the next step. The historians, again, will know the Battle of Cannae, the greatest battle of destruction probably in history against all odds, but one that Hannibal doesn't do anything about afterwards. And Mahabal, according to Livy, his cavalry commander says to him afterwards, your trouble, pal, is you know how to win on the battlefield, but you don't know what to do with it. You don't know how to exploit it. It writes in exploitation as a fundamental. And it talks about initiative. And in my mind, there are three sorts of people in the world. Those who make things happen, 
those to whom things happen and those who lie around wondering what the bloody hell just happened. <laughs> and unless you are the first, you cannot succeed in politics, in strategy, or in military stuff. And then it talks about all of the above has to be done in a way that's joined up with all of these different people, which adds a commensurate layer of complexity for every single one of those people with whom you're dealing. And from that, it talks about the future structure of the British Army. A contingent capability to go and do the heavy lifting, an ability to get out into the world and do stuff with the world and understand it, and every now and again there'll be an Olympics or something like it, and the nation will say, we've made a mistake here, we need the army to step in at short notice and put this right for us, and will expect us to be able to do so. So, an irreducible best little army in the world, if you like, a get out there and understand, and influence by being among people, and all the other stuff at home taken out of the hide of those two. So, in summary, and I'm nearly there, deja vu, when I put this up on the higher command of staff course and say, who wrote this? They all say, sir, sir, please, sir, Rupert Smith, sir. War among the people. They'll quote the chapter that it came out of the utility of force because they're all told to read it before they come on the course. And of course they're wrong. The person who said that was Viscount Haldane in 1907 when he was assessing what to do with the British Army, how to reform it as a result of what we had learned from the Boer War. Obsessed with spots as he was, he reformed the army to go out and fight future Boer Wars. How right was he seven years later? So I'm not so sure that we have had a doctrinal, a doctrinal epiphany. I think that it's just a question of understanding that we have been obsessed with character and that you need to get character and nature firmly in your mind, balance off against each other and be ready to cope with both of those two things. <coughs>